of 1 Corinthians here this morning. And uh, we've been talking a lot about marriage lately. So it's such an important subject. We don't want to rush through it. And we've just been taking little bite-sized pieces of it. Paul started talking about, uh, in, the, in the first part of the chapter there, those that are unmarried. You know, asking that question, should I just not get married? Uh, because of all the problems that, that come along with marriage, should I just not be married? And, and all the things that are going on with marriage. Maybe I should just refrain from it. And Paul said, no. If you have that gift, you can be celibate. And if that's how God's gifted you, certainly you can use that for God's kingdom. And you can work hard for God's kingdom. But if you're not gifted in that way, by all means, go get married. If you're going to burn with passion, uh, don't uh, stay single. And then last week we looked at uh, a category of marriage between two believers. Uh, Paul talked about those, uh, those believers that uh, are considering possibly getting a divorce. And, and he said, absolutely not. You need to stay together. It's just like what Jesus had to say. Nothing has changed. Uh, only because of the hardness of your heart, Moses allowed you to get a divorce. And so between two believers, you know, there there's really shouldn't be a divorce unless there's a, a sexual immorality. And so... We looked at that last week. This week, we're going to look at uh, another category. You see there in verse 12, he says, but to the rest, <laughs> to everybody else. We've got uh, unmarried folks, and then we've got married believers. And to the rest, it, he's talking about uh, an unequally yoked situation where you have a believer and a non-believer. And, and Paul's going to address that because it's a, a very critical area to address even in our day today. And so we're going to look at that. I've called it apples and oranges And so as we begin to look at verse 12 there, follow along with me as I read it. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? Heavenly Father, we do come to you right now and we ask for your leading and your guiding, for your wisdom, your discernment in this passage of Scripture, Lord. Uh, Lord, we know that it is a, a very painful thing for many who, are, who find themselves in this situation. And so, Father, we, we do ask that you would just help us to understand it, help us to put it in practice in our lives. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, one of the brothers here in the fellowship told me a, a story about two men who went to a men's conference and they got saved at that men's conference. And they went back home and, and a couple of weeks later they got back together to share uh, with each other what happened when they got back to their wives who were not believers. And so the one guy said, well, you know, I got home and I said, honey, we're going to start going to church and we're going to start reading our Bibles and we're going to start praying together. And he said, and the other guy said, well, what happened? Well, I didn't see her for a week. But, but then this eye started uh, opening again and, and the swelling went down and eventually I could see out of that eye as well. And uh, he said, what happened to you? And he goes, well, I did the same thing. I said, honey, we're going to start going to church and you're going to get saved and you're going to start reading your Bible and, and I'm going to be the spiritual head of this house. And, and, and yeah, the same thing. He said, well, what happened? He said, well, it was amazing. He said, my wife got down on her knees, both knees, And looked under the bed and said, You get out from under there and say that to my face! (laughs) Well, unfortunately, uh, that's all too common, you know, where you have a situation where uh, a couple are living in the world and they're, they're just out there, just pure pagans and not walking with the Lord at all. And, uh, all of a sudden one of them gets saved. And then they go home with all this excitement. Hey, let's, let's, you know, you just, you just got to meet Jesus and you've got to know him. And, and there's a, a friction that's developed there. And the person says, Hey, I didn't sign on for this. You know, when we got married, we were drinking and drugging together and, and chasing whatever. And, and Hey, I didn't agree to this. This isn't the marriage that I signed on for. And a friction begins to develop 
within that marriage. And, and so just like in, in the day that Paul is writing and just like to today, today, we have uh, some issues to deal with. And so Paul very clearly addresses that issue here. And, you know, I, I've entitled it Apples and Oranges because it, it's that figurative idiom that we use to talk about things that just don't go well together. You know, you're comparing apples to oranges here. They just, they don't line up with each other. Uh, group to, things that are grouped together that are not similar, they don't really mix. They're too different. They're so different that it, it's, it's hard to bring them together. And so, you know, as we get started here, I, I just want to say that I know this is a very, very painful situation for many and, and even some in this church here. And so, um, you know, it, it's something that we really need to hear from the Lord on and it's something that, uh, that we just need to understand very clearly because there are, uh, you, you know, we kind of sometimes don't understand the situation when there's a, a believer and a non-believer in the church and how we can help them and that sort of thing. And it is a very difficult situation for many believers around the world as they are in that situation. Well, Paul refers to it later on in the book of Second Corinthians as being unequally yoked. And that's the term that we use as Christians. Well, you're unequally yoked. You're, you're yoked up with a, a, a person that's pulling in a different way than you are. And that's the idea, is that two animals uh, that are, are uh, plowing a field or doing some sort of work, pulling a wagon or whatever, those two animals really need to be similar to each other in strength and temperaments, and, and they need to be able to get along with each other. Otherwise, you're not going to get much work done. You're going to be constantly, you know, trying to uh, keep these animals from fighting with each other. Or you're going to be plowing in a circle as one animal is much stronger than the other animal. And, and they'll just, it'll cause problems. And so Paul said, you know, don't unequally yoke yourself with an unbeliever. Uh, you're trying to accomplish one thing, but you're going in two very different directions. And as we looked at last week, just being married in the world today is, is hard enough on its own to, with two believers who have the Holy Spirit dwelling in their hearts, much less you bring into that uh, one believer and one uh, non-believer. And it be, becomes a very difficult situation as you're pulling each other in other directions. And so again, Paul in 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And certainly we can apply this not only to marriage, but we can also apply this to uh, business partners or, or just people who are trying to do a common thing together. You know, you don't want to unequally yoke yourself with an unbeliever because it's just going to cause problems. And often what happens is that unbeliever is going to influence the believer and uh, possibly draw them down or drag them down. And so he goes on there, he says, For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? It's a very um, understandable question that Paul is asking here. He goes on and he says, And what accord has Christ with Belial? And the word Belial there is just a, a word that means worthless or wicked, and it's often referred to Satan, uh, worthless and wicked Satan. Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? He goes on and he finishes that, that, that thought by saying, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of God. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. You know, back in the the days of the Jews in the temple, uh, when David and and Solomon began to establish that temple worship there, uh, you know, if if an unbeliever from the outside wanted to come in, they they were allowed to come in, but they had to, uh, you know, conform and be converted to become a Jew. And there wasn't much evangelism going on. People had to come into that temple. And so it's very different now because we are the temple. The Holy Spirit is dwelling in us. And now we are told to go out into the world. And so I think that's the, the difference that we see here. When, when before, if a, if a Jew took on an unbelieving wife, it was a horrible sin. And, uh, and they were told to you know, break up that marriage. But it's very different now. As Paul says, no, if they're willing to stay there, just let them stay there. And so as we begin to look at this, there's a couple of things that we want to look at. Within an unequally yoked situation like that, there's, there's really uh, two types uh, or two people within that relationship. There has to be a compromiser. And it can't be the believer. Uh, the unbeliever has to say, well, okay, I'm willing to put up with this. 
I'm willing to go along with this. I'm willing to compromise on my uh, pagan ways, perhaps, uh, for the sake of... Of, of saving the marriage. There can't be a compromise on the, the believer's part, really. The believer cannot say, well, you know, I'll, I'll compromise on my beliefs, I'll compromise on God's standard, I'll compromise on this, and, and just give in to whatever kind of uh, wickedness is going on. The compromise really has to come from that unbeliever. And that's what Paul's saying here. If they're willing to stay, if they're willing to live in that union, if they're willing to go along with uh, the marriage still after that profession of faith, then stay in the marriage by all means. Don't break up the marriage if they're willing to stay there. And then the other person in that relationship is the Christian, is the believer. And you become the sanctifier. You become the one who is, who is bringing the word of God into that home. You're bringing the, the, the pure presence of the Lord uh, because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. In the temple of the Lord, you are bringing that, that presence into the marriage. You're bringing that refining into the marriage. And, and into the lives of your children. And so we'll look at those two things here today. First of all, the compromiser. Paul again says, to the rest. Who is he speaking to? Again, as you look up there, you see Paul says, to the unmarried. And then he says, to the married. Now he's saying again, to the, to the rest. To those that are not believers, uh, not both of the marriage partners are believers, but one is, uh, to the rest of those folks who are in that category. I, not the Lord, say. Now again, we looked at last week, if you look back up into verse 10, Paul says, I command, yet not I, but the Lord. The Lord had laid out the parameters for a married couple already. And so Paul just referred back to that. Don't change what God has already said. God has already laid this out and there's no change in that. But now Paul is kind of changing that around. He says, but to the rest, I, not the Lord, And what is he saying? He's saying that Jesus hasn't addressed this. This isn't an issue that has been laid out in Scripture yet. It's not that Paul is saying uh, what I'm saying is just my opinion and what I'm saying is is not uh, coming from the Holy Spirit. If you flip your page there, the very last verse, as Paul is going through this whole chapter, talking about uh, marriages and and other relationships, in the last verse there, uh, he says at the end, according to my judgment... And I think I also have the Spirit of God. And certainly Paul did have the Spirit of God. And what he was saying and the things that he was writing to the churches were coming from the Holy Spirit. He felt like he was being led by the Spirit to say these things. And so that's the uh, understanding that we need to have here. It's just something that hasn't been addressed yet. And so Paul is saying, well, you know, this is not Jesus speaking. This is, this is how I believe the Lord would have us to understand this situation. And so he says there, not the Lord, if any brother has a wife who does not believe. And so clearly he's talking about a a brother, a a believer, a man who is a believer, a brother in the Lord, uh, has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him. Let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. And so it's very clear. If they're willing to make that compromise, and, you know, I call it compromiser, and it's it's kind of a a negative term, but, you know, it's just this idea that I'm willing to compromise on on this. You know, I'm willing to give in, not necessarily to become a Christian, and and certainly that is the hope, that that purifying, that sanctifying influence of the, the saved person in that marriage is going to bring them to that place. Uh, but it doesn't always work that way. Uh, but that person, if they're willing to just kind of go along with it, then don't let them divorce. Let them stay together. There's no reason to divorce if they can try to work it out. Well, again, to the Jew, this would have been a very difficult thing for them to deal with. All through the Old Testament, they're told in the law, do not go after those uh, those pagan people out there. Do not give your sons and your daughters to be married to them. There is this idea of there needs to be a separation from the world. And uh, at, at various points, there, there were they, Moses told them and others told them, you know, you need to be separate. You need to be holy. Look up with uh, pagan uh, peoples because they are going to uh, drag you down and they're going to uh, influence you to begin to worship their gods. And God said, I'm a jealous God. I don't want you going out and whoring after these other gods, these false idols that are out there. And if you, if you do that, if you marry with them, it eventually will happen. 
And so, of course, in the mind of the Jew now who has become a Christian, who, uh, who has uh, understood that Jesus is the fulfillment of their Christ, their Messiah, and they have now accepted Jesus, and perhaps they're still with a Jew who says, absolutely, Jesus was not my Messiah, Jesus is not the Christ, and they refuse to accept Jesus. And so now uh, this person who is a Jew perhaps is thinking, well, Am I in that situation now? Am I in a situation where I need to become separated from this person who is not a true believer? And, uh, of course, in the, the Greek world, you know, perhaps Jews were marrying Greeks and, and in those situations, and they wanted to know. Uh, again, these are questions that are being asked to Paul. They have written a letter to Paul and said, Paul, what about this? What about if, if I'm a believer but my wife is, a, is still a Jew and she refuses to accept Jesus? Should I put her away? Should I not be married to that unbeliever? And so they're, they're very good questions that are being asked here. And of course, they're relevant to us today. I want you to turn back and we'll, we'll just get a flavor for that a little bit here. In Exodus chapter 34, we see these restrictions laid out very clearly in the law. Exodus 34 verse 16 is the first one we'll look at there. And as he begins to talk about that, he says, lest you, in verse 15, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they play the harlot with their gods and make sacrifice to their gods and one of them invites you and you eat of his sacrifice and you take of his daughters for your sons and his daughters play the harlot with their gods and make your sons play the harlot with their gods. You shall make no molded gods for yourself. And so you get that idea that uh, you know, don't go after the gods of those believers. Don't hook up with those unbelievers out there because they're going to want to take you and have you worship their gods along with them. It's just a, a natural thing. And then in, in Deuteronomy, flip a couple pages to the right there. You see the same thing in chapter 7 of Deuteronomy. Verse 3. In verse 2 he says, When the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them. God was bringing the nation of Israel into that promised land as a judgment upon the people that were already there. And, you know, they were extremely wicked people and we've talked a lot about that. They were people who would offer their infant babies up to idols that were molten hot and and their arms were extended and they'd place those little infant babies in the arms of those false gods and allow those babies to be burned in that way and killed in that way. They were extremely wicked, extremely perverse people. And so God was bringing the nation of Israel to judge them as a judgment upon them. He said, destroy them. They're so wicked. They're just absolutely uh, unredeemable. And I want them destroyed and you're going to be my implement to do that, my implement to destroy them. So why would you join yourself with them is what he's saying there. Um, Let's see, in verse 3, Nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor take your their daughter for your son. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you. And destroy you suddenly. And so you get the idea there. And you can go ahead and flip on back to 1 Corinthians. Why would you want to join yourself to these people that God is going to destroy because of their wickedness, because of their their evil that they're involved in? Don't give your sons and daughters to them because they will begin to worship those same idols in the way that they're doing it. And so Jews that were married, Jews that found themselves in a backslidden situation and they've given in to those things and they've, they've gone and they've married a, a woman from Moab or somewhere else, you know. And then a, a revival would break out as we see in Ezra and Nehemiah as they're coming back from that Babylonian captivity. Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah realized, wow, so many here in the congregation have married into these other families and they have children now. And it was, it was clearly said that they should put those wives and the children away. Ezra 10, Shechaniah spoke up and said to Ezra, we have trespassed against our God and have taken pagan wives from the peoples of the land. 
And then he goes on and says, Now therefore let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and those who have been born to them. We're going to put them away. We're going we're gonna to purify ourselves. We're going to come back to a place of, of doing what God has told us to do in that covenant. And that's a key there, that they have this covenant with God that they would not do this. Uh, we don't have such a covenant in the Christian uh, life, but we are to be holy. We are to not let those influences of the world uh, change us and mold us into the image of the world, but rather we're to be conformed into the image of Jesus himself. Later on in Nehemiah, same kind of situation. Nehemiah shows up there and it's a different time now and he finds the same thing. Uh, The people have gone astray again and have married off into the other nations. Uh, He says there, So I contended with them and and cursed them, struck some of them and pulled out the hair uh, and made them swear by God saying, You shall not give your daughters as wives to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons uh, or or yourselves. He goes on in verse 30, I cleanse them of every pagan, everything pagan. I also assign duties to the priests and the Levites, each to his service. And so this idea, as Nehemiah went out, he, he purified the camp. He purified the people and brought them back to a place of sanctification and, and, clean, uh, and cleanness. Put away the false idols. Put away the things of this world. They're corrupting evil influence. And if you dabble with them, uh, if you marry them, you will fall into that as well. And so it's interesting. He says there, I cleanse them of everything pagan. Then I also assigned duties to the priests. And you know, you are a priest in your home and you have duties. You have a duty to, to purify your home of these kind of influences of the world coming in, of paganism coming into your home. You have a duty to be that purifying influence in your home, especially if you're the only believer in that home. It falls to you. You have a responsibility as a believer to be that purifying force, that that purifying presence in that home. And so uh, one thing that Alan Redpath said that I really liked, he's talking about, uh, you know, we need to be that purifying influence, but sometimes we can go overboard and we can become a nag and we can be, you know, just really pushing that person away by our persistence and, you know, we know that it's out of a heart of love. But, but what Alan Redpath says here is really neat. He says, be careful how you treat them, won't you? Don't nag at them. Don't drive, don't drive religion down their throat and give them a miserable time because you are saved and they are not. Be patient and tolerant, although the change may make them absolutely furious with you. He goes on to say, if you long to see your loved one, sorry, typo, converted, Uh, then be grateful to God for his mercy in your own soul and pray with all your heart that you may also live in patient love with them that the very difference in your life may attract them to the Lord Jesus. And so there's more of a focus not on them and the things that they are doing. Obviously, they're a sinner. They're an unbeliever. They have not been changed in their heart. Their nature has not been changed. And to say, well, you're a drunk and you're wicked and you're evil and you're perverse and and to just be pointing the finger at them, really, uh, yeah, duh. I mean, of course they're, they're not changed. They haven't accepted the Lord yet. They haven't had the Holy Spirit come into their life and give them the power. They haven't repented of their sins yet. And so, of course, they're going to be that way. And so for you to just constantly nag at them, is, is really not going to help the situation. What they need to see is a change in you, that the very difference of your life may attract them to the Lord Jesus. And I think that's very important that we understand it in that way. If you're in that situation, and, and this really doesn't apply just to marriage, it applies to you know, your workplace, where you go to school, and just the circle of influence that you have. Uh, if you just point the finger at them and say, you're a sinner, you're doing this, you're doing that, it's really kind of a duh situation. Yeah, of course. Of course I am. And oftentimes they know what they're doing is wrong. They just don't care because they haven't had that changed uh, nature yet. And so really what they need to see is just a consistency from you. They need to see a difference in your life. This week as I was studying this, I was reminded of a, of a, a thing that happened to me in the ninth grade. It's something I haven't thought of in years. And, you know, I was coming to the end in, in the ninth grade. I was coming to the end of my glorious football career. 
You know, I was this little scrawny short kid that uh, just wasn't growing at the same uh, rate everybody else was. And, and I just wasn't able to perform like the other guys because they were getting big and strong. And I was just kind of staying where I was at. And uh, but I loved football. I loved football so much. And I so much wanted to be a football player. And so as I was getting into my ninth grade year and everybody was sprouting up, I was kind of getting resigned to the second string and and not getting to handle the ball as much as I wanted to and that sort of thing. And uh, I I got a little discouraged about it. And one Friday, a friend of mine, also I was getting involved in drugs at the time and starting to smoke marijuana. and, And so I just didn't have a whole lot of motivation to do anything. And so a friend of mine that I was smoking pot with said, hey, let's skip uh, the last class of the day and let's skip uh, football practice and, and, and go out and get high. And so I did with this guy. Well, later that afternoon, I saw my football coach. And I'll never forget this guy. You know, I can't remember his name and I can't remember a whole lot about him, but I remember he was involved in a horrible car accident or some kind of accident that burned him severely. And he had kind of webbed fingers, you know, where the skin had melted and his nose was kind of pulled over and messed up. And But he was a very passionate man about uh, teaching. He was a history teacher. Of course, football coaches always have to be the history teacher, right? They can't teach anything else. But um, anyway, he was just a really neat guy, a really neat teacher. And I saw him that afternoon after football practice. And he just gave me that look like, yeah, I know you skip practice. And so the next week, Monday, I showed up to football practice. And actually, I, I, I saw him during the day at school. And he, he came up to me and he said, you know, I, I know you skipped practice on Friday and you're not going to be able to play in the game uh, this coming week because you skipped practice. And that really hurt me. I just, oh man, I, I was kind of discouraged, but I still wanted to play. I still wanted to get out there and play, you know. And I said, come on, coach. And I begged him and begged him. He said, no. He said, you're not committed to this team and you're not going to play on, on, I think the game was on Friday. And, uh, and so that night at football practice, I, I, again, just begged him, come on, coach, please, please, please. And after I kept begging him and, and just really pleading with him to let me play, he said, all right, I'll tell you what. For the rest of this week, every time you get the ball, and I was kind of a running back, I was a second string running back. He said, every time you get the ball, I want you to make at least four yards a minimum of four yards. If you make four yards every time you get the ball, I'll let you play on Friday. And I I had no idea at the time what a brilliant thing that was that he said. But man, every time they handed me the ball, I gave it everything I had. And I would look and I would see that, that, okay, where do I have to make it to? And I'd look at the marks and, okay, I got to make it to that spot. And boy, they'd hand me the ball and I'd run in there and I'd just do everything I possibly could to get to that line. And, you know, sometimes I made it and sometimes I didn't. And when I didn't make it, I'd look over at him to see if he saw me. And sure enough, he's watching. He knew I didn't make it. He made two yards, three yards. Okay, you made five yards, you know, that kind of thing. But he was checking my commitment level. He was watching me closely to see how committed is he. And I was committed. I was, I really wanted to make it. I really wanted to play in that game. Well, at the end of the week, he finally came to me and he said, you know, the greatest running backs in the NFL, most of them don't have a four-yard ad, four yard average. It's very, very difficult to run four yards every time you get the ball. Impossible, really. It's really impossible. It's, a, it's an impossible thing. But still, he knew I was committed to do it. And as he watched me... He, he knew that I was really trying my hardest and I was giving it everything I had. And so he let me play in the game that Friday. But I thought about that in light of, you know, this situation that we're talking about. That husband, that wife, that friend at work, those people that we know that hear us talking about going to church and they hear us talking and, and pleading with them, come on, you need to come. Come on, you need to become a Christian. The things that we say with our mouth are, are one thing, but they want to see the commitment. And they're standing there on that sideline watching you. And they're, they're watching how hard you're running. They're watching how hard you're trying. They're watching your commitment level to see, is this real? Is this real? 
Or is this just something they're saying with their mouth? Is this just another scam? Is this just another thing out there that maybe I could try this for a little while and give it a shot? Is, is it going to work in my life? Is it real? What is their commitment level? What is your commitment level? Are you trying your hardest? I'll just let you think about that. Because I think, you know, as they stand there on that sideline, they know, just as my coach knew, if, I'm, if I really believe what I'm saying, if I really believe the things that I'm telling you, or it's just lip service because I want to play in the game. Well, if we can really dedicate ourselves to this, we become that sanctifying presence. We become the sanctifier of that family, of that situation. If you're in that situation, you become a purifying presence in that family situation. And that's what Paul's talking about here. He says, "For the un- don't let them divorce, don't let them break up. If they're willing to live there, that's good because the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, verse 14. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But now they are holy. There is a purifying presence that comes into that home. Uh, As you begin to just get rid of all the garbage and you get rid of all the, the pagan influences and the ungodly influences in that home, if the husband, if the wife is willing to let you do that, you know, and that's kind of a battle as well. It's a hard-fought battle. It's not an easy situation as you're, as you're trying to be that influence. Sometimes you say, no, don't get rid of those movies. Don't, don't stop doing that. I like doing that. And sometimes you have to just, okay. You have to uh, just be able to, with your own life, be that influence within the home. In your home, in your family, is, is where you have to start. You know, it's interesting that as Jesus uh, talked to his disciples there, he said, I want you to go out into the world. Start here in Jerusalem and then go into uh, Judea and then Samaria and then the uttermost parts of the world. And it's the same with us as individuals. We start in our home, in our families. We are to our husbands and our wives and to our children, that influence in our own home and in our family, our extended family, aunts and uncles and grandfathers and grandmothers. And they're watching us. They're standing on the sideline and they're watching you. And they're, they're watching your commitment level. They're watching to see if you really believe what you're saying. It's interesting there, it begins to talk about the children as well. Your children would be unclean, it says, but now they are holy. And, you know, we we don't want to try to say, well, the children will be saved. You know, each one of those children has to accept Jesus. They have to repent of their sins. They have to come to a place of realizing that uh, I am in need of a Savior. And they have to accept Him, just like the rest of us. But they have now the ability, because they're still in the home, if the marriage breaks up and, and, and possibly the father takes the children away, or the mother takes the children away, the unsaved uh, uh, part of that marriage just leaves, says, hey, I'm not willing to deal with this. This is not what I signed on for. I'm taking the kids and I'm out of here. Now those children are, are not going to be exposed to that presence anymore. They'll be exposed to that pagan society. They'll be exposed more to those influences and they won't have that, that purifying influence in the home. And so it's very important that we hold on to that. You know, it's interesting, many, many years ago, uh, the society really believed that, you know, it's worth it for the kids to stay together. You know, I hate you and I know you hate me, but man, let's stay together just for the sake of the children. But even now, that's kind of gone out, you know, and, and people won't stay together just for the sake of the children. But now they're in that situation where they, they're exposed to going to church on Sunday. They're exposed to uh, reading the Bible, maybe prayer around the table and, and just, uh, you know, holy influences. And really, these words holy and sanctified, you know, they're just to be set apart. Those, those are the real meaning of those words. To take you out of that pagan influence and set you apart. To set you over into a place where you just have uh, the Lord's presence in your life and, and you're abiding in His Word, abiding in His truth. And that makes you holy in that sense. But then in verse 15 there, it says, But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. 
a brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. God does want to see peace in the home, and, and sometimes it just doesn't come, unfortunately. But again, not just in the home. You know, if you're, if you're a believer here this morning, and, and your wife is a believer, or your husband is a believer, and you think, well, this doesn't really apply to me. It does apply to you. Because you are a, 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 a purifying presence wherever you go. Again, you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is dwelling in you. And you take that presence wherever you go. Whatever situation you go into, the workplace, the schools, wherever you're at, you take that purifying influence. The circle of influence that you have is different from any other person on the entire planet. Only you have that circle around you. And God has placed you in that place to, to be that purifying influence, to make that place a holy place. You know, it's a good thing when people at work go, we, they swear, and then they go, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, and you go, that's good. That's good. You're having a purifying influence in that workplace. And, and they may keep doing it every time, and that's fine, though. But they realize, you know, people know what's right and wrong for the most part. Sometimes they just don't care. But when you're there and, and, and you're just a silent witness, you know, you, you talk about the Lord a little bit, but, uh, you know, you're just living out your life before them. And they realize there's something about this person. It's not right for me to swear around them. It's not right for me to tell a dirty joke in their presence. And they feel defiled themselves when they begin to tell that joke. They start saying, oh... I don't know, maybe I shouldn't say this around you. So can you go outside and I'll say it <laughs> no, behind your back? <laughs> no, I don't know. Uh, but that's a good thing. You're having an influence in that workplace. Be careful about that because you can become a hypocrite very quickly if you're not dedicated to it. If you're just giving that lip service, they're watching you. Be very careful. Um. First Timothy, Paul tells Timothy, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Continue in God's word, continue in his truth. And the people around you, as they see your life, and as you're, they're exposed to, to you and, and just the truth that you're able to bring, they will get saved, possibly. It doesn't always happen that way, but that's the idea is to just continue in that. And of course, you know, we are to be that purifying influence in the entire world, in our nation. We are the salt of the earth, is what Jesus said. We bring that presence wherever we go, or we should be anyway. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its, sav- its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world, he goes on to say. You are that influence in your home, in your family, in the circle of influence you have, in the nation we are as a church. And, and so it's such a responsibility that we have placed upon us. We are that sanctifier in this world. You know, as you talk about the end times and people ask about... Uh, you know, the Antichrist, who's the Antichrist and when's he going to be revealed and all that sort of stuff. You know, it's interesting. He's not going to be revealed as uh, Second Thessalonians. Do we have time? Yeah, let's go there. Go ahead and hold your place in Corinthians and turn to that passage there. Second Thessalonians, and this is, of course, a, a very well-known passage, but it's important for our study here today. The Holy Spirit is dwelling, again, in these temples that are all sitting here in this room. And, and we are that purifying force. We are a restraining force of the evil that's in this world. And it, it would seem that here in Second Thessalonians or verse 1 there, it says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind nor troubled, either in spirit or by word or by letter as it is from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means that the day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition. And so there's going to be a falling away first. And, you know, many believe that that is just the apostasy of the church. 
As many, our hearts will grow cold and we'll care more about the riches of this world and and pleasure and, and fulfilling the lusts of our flesh than we will about seeking the Lord. And there'll be a falling away. And I think we see that today, that there is a falling away from the truth as our nation and and nations around the world that were once firmly grounded in God's truth and God's word are falling away from that. And we don't believe in the the, uh, veracity of Scripture anymore. We don't believe the authority of Scripture. But again, to be that purifying force, we cannot lose that, that flavor. We cannot lose that authority of God's word and that ability to speak boldly His truth wherever we are in whatever situation we're in. And so there it talks about the falling away will come first and then the man of sin will be revealed who opposes and exalts, verse 4, himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Now this is the Antichrist that we're we're talking about here. Verse 5, Do you not remember that when I was still with you I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Who is he that restrains? Well, We believe that it's the Holy Spirit working through the church, working through the believers. We are restraining the evil right now. And you may not think that you're doing much to do that, but really, truly, the church is restraining the evil in this world. You think about if the church was not here, if the church was not, uh, you know, doing the things that we're doing. uh, Evil people and evil influence would just be able to run roughshod around this world. And they would be able to do whatever perverse thing they wanted to do. But it is the the Christian influence in the world that goes out and we are salt and we are light and we try to prevent uh, a further decline in our society. By continuing to preach the word, we are that purifying force. We are restraining the evil. But as we know through other scriptures, and you can go ahead and turn on back over to 1 Corinthians, that the church will be raptured out. Before the Antichrist is, is revealed, the church will be raptured out. That purifying, restraining force will be taken out of this earth. And then you really don't want to be here at that point. You really don't want to be there here at that point as the Antichrist sets up his kingdom and begins to, to just uh, take over the world. It's an awful thing. Well, again, as we uh, just kind of finish up here, God has called us to peace. Uh, if that brother, if that sister wants to depart, then, then Paul just says, let them go ahead and depart. We don't want to force them to stay in that situation and, and just cause a division and, and continual fighting and arguing. If they don't want to stay, just let them stay. But for the believer, you're not to depart from that situation. This is a command from the Lord here. You are to stay in that situation and, and not... Uh, nag on them and push them so hard that they leave for the purpose of, hey, I didn't leave. They're the ones that left. I didn't have anything to do with it. I just stayed and, you know, you don't want to go that way. You don't want to push them so far that they just have to leave. Uh, again, you want to be that purifying force and, and just with the, the witness of your life, win them to the Lord, not drive them away. And so, but if, you, if that doesn't work out, you know, it doesn't always work out that way. Uh, they reject Christ completely and they walk away, you're to let them go. God wants there to be peace within the home. Peace within the home is is very precious to the Lord. And so um, just let them go. The last verse there, he says, For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? How do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? And the answer is you don't know. You don't know. And so you keep on. You, you do what you know you're supposed to do and you keep trying to be that influence. Same thing with the people out in, in our sphere of influence, our circle of influence. We don't know if they're going to come to the Lord, but we tell them about the Lord anyway and we, we try to witness to them with our lives and with our words. We try to win them. We don't know if they're going to come to the Lord. And you know, again, this is a, a very tough situation for a believer to be in. 
Um, and, and it's an uphill battle almost every day. And you, you think, you know, man, this is so hard. How can I ever stay in this situation? How can I remain in this situation? How can I ever win them over to the Lord? They, they hate the Lord. They hate Christianity. They hate everything about it. How can I win them over? Well, you just don't know. You just don't know what God has in mind. You don't know what he's going to be able to do in that situation. And so you just keep on being faithful. You just keep on trying. You just keep on praying for the power of the Holy Spirit to come and give you that ability to, to stand in that situation. You put on your armor and you just keep on fighting the good fight. That's all you can do, whatever situation you're in. It's interesting, there's a story of a, of a fourth century monk. And he was a guy that just kind of lived a monastic life, you know. He, he didn't go out very much and, and just stayed there in the monastery. And, but he felt at one point that, that God was calling him to leave that place and to go to Rome. And he didn't know why, he just felt that God was calling him to go to Rome. And the story goes that he, he, for some reason, just felt compelled. And so he went to Rome. And as he was there in Rome and he saw all the idolatry and everything, he was just grieved in his spirit. And, and he got caught up in a crowd at one point. And the crowd was going down to the Colosseum. And he made his way into the Colosseum there. And he'd never been there before. And he looked around at all of the, the, the marble and everything and the glory of it. And it was wonderful. But then the, the gladiator games began. And he began to see the people being killed and, and just horribly mangled and, and the lions coming out and eating people and the gladiators fighting and all that stuff. And he was just grieved to the core and he realized this is why God had brought him there. And he, as he was there in that Colosseum, he stood up and he raised his arms and he said, in the name of Christ, stop this now. And people heard him and they said, ah, shut up, you know, and they started mocking him. And the battles continued on and he continued, in the name of Christ, stop this now. And people started saying, kill him, throw him in. And they grabbed him and they threw him down into the Colosseum, down where the gladiators were. And he, he continued saying the same words, in the name of Christ, stop this now. And a gladiator ran him through. And as he was laying there dying, he said one more time, in the name of Christ, stop this now. Well, at that time, Christianity had, had taken a foothold in the Roman Empire. And the, the emperor at that time was so moved by this man standing up and, and being a witness in that way that he wrote an edict after that and he said, we won't do this anymore. And that was the last gladiator game that was ever performed or, or held in the Colosseum because of that one man being faithful to do what God had told him to do at a huge sacrifice, the sacrifice of his own life. And so it's, it's a very interesting thing. And, and many people say that that wasn't the last gladiator game, but certainly it was a point where uh, people really began to say, really, should we really be doing this? And, uh, and the public sentiment changed. The public mentality was, this is horrible. This, why, this is barbaric. Why are we doing this? And those games ceased. Well, as we end here, just two more verses to share with you. Colossians 4 or 5, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. The Lord is coming soon. We really don't have time to waste. And we need to just walk in wisdom towards those unbelievers around us in your marriage and, and, and wherever you're at. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. And I just pray that that will be your prayer this week. I, I would encourage you to memorize that scripture. Let me have wisdom towards those who are outside of the faith that I possess. Let me have wisdom towards them because the time is, is short. I need to redeem the time that I have, to redeem the time that I have with my children at home, with uh, my wife at home, my husband at home with those people that I work with. There is no time to waste, really, that idea. Let your speech be seasoned, that idea of just you're a flavor. In whatever place you find yourself, you are a flavoring, savoring uh, influence, a purifying presence. The Holy Spirit is dwelling within your hearts 
and you are there to be that purifying influence. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word here today. We thank you for your truth. Lord, we thank you for your spirit dwelling in each of our lives. And we thank you, Lord, that we can uh, be a, a purifying influence in the world around us. Lord, we need your uh, power to do that. We recognize that it is a very difficult situation to be unequally yoked. And Lord, I pray for each person in this room that is in that place right now. Lord, each person that is, is just trying to be that witness in the home and, and trying to softly uh, encourage and warn and, and, um, and teach that unbeliever in the home, Lord, that they need to come to a saving knowledge of you. Lord, we pray for their strength. Lord, we pray that you would uh, just strengthen their hands and their feet and their lips as they uh, just uh, remain in that place. Lord, even though it is very difficult and that, that sometimes it seems easier just to walk away. Father, we ask that you would strengthen them, encourage them. Lord, and as the, the folks that are in this room possibly that are on the other side of that, they are the unbelieving spouse. Lord, I, I pray that you would just convict their hearts here today. Lord, that you would draw them into a closer relationship with you, that you would draw them to their knees, Lord, in repentance. And draw them to that place of realizing they need a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus Christ. We thank you for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.